Okay. Good morning, everyone, and uh, welcome to BC 309, our second lecture for this week uh, on urban church planting. Let's take a moment just to pray together and we'll get started. Can I ask somebody, please, in the class to pray? And then we will start. Can somebody just pray together with us? Can I pray, Pastor? Our Heavenly Father, once again, we are most grateful and thankful unto you for your grace and your mercy. We thank you for the gift of life this morning. Father, we are praying you committing our class into your mighty hands, O God. We pray that guide us with your spirit and lead us in the way, O God. Father, grant us understanding and insight. We pray that you grant Pastor Ashes the utterances to be able to explain the things for us to understand. And we pray for our colleagues that, Father, you continue to sustain all of us in our various destinations. We pray for good internet connection and we pray for your calm and your peace to restore among us. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen. Amen. All right. Welcome, everyone. Thank you for joining the class. So we are continuing talking about the uh, spiritual side, the spiritual aspects of um, founding a church, pioneering a church in the urban context. And uh, so uh, let me just go ahead and share the PDF. Then we'll pick up from where we paused yesterday. So we talk about, you know, what is the enemy doing? What is Satan doing? And blinding the minds of people, holding people in bondage, uh, hindering the proclamation of the gospel, trying to infiltrate the church and weaken the church uh, through various means. Uh, we have seen some examples in Revelation 2, but this is not the only, the only thing he does. Other things he would try to weaken the church, you, you know, try to disrupt the unity and peace and so on. Um, but then the church's responsibility is we've been called to be light to the Gentiles, as we saw yesterday. And part of being light to the Gentiles is to open blind eyes, to open the prison doors, um, to tell the people, the prisoners, to come forth, to those who are in darkness, come into the light. And uh, so the anointing is given to us, the presence of the Holy Spirit, to, to bind, to overcome, to subdue what the devil is doing so that we can spoil his goods. And we also saw about uh, kingdom authority in Matthew 16. Uh, the, the keys of the kingdom have been given to the church. The church advances to the gates of hell. These are the power centers of hell. And through prayer, through using our authority, we uh, advance the kingdom of God and the gates of hell cannot stop the church. Um, Second Corinthians chapter 10, verses 3 to 6, we know that we are using spiritual weapons uh, against the enemy. You know, Paul writes, he says, though we walk in the flesh, we do not war according to the flesh. And then he says, the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but they are mighty in God, are mighty through God, to the pulling down of strongholds, casting down imaginations and every high thing or every reasoning that exalts itself against the knowledge of God and bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. So really, it's like our warfare, it's a spiritual warfare. Our warfare is divinely empowered. God gives us divinely and uh, divine weapons. And very interestingly, our warfare is dealing with what the devil is doing in the minds of people. It's talking about strongholds, it's talking about arguments and reasonings and imaginations and thoughts. So these are things in the minds of people. And we are using the weapons of our warfare to destroy these things in the minds of people. Uh, these, are, this is, this is, these are things that the devil is putting in their minds uh, to prevent them from receiving the light of the gospel. But as the weapons we've been given 
addresses these things and uh, we pull them down. So we are countering or we are going against destroying Satan's strongholds. And this is, you know, typically we use the term spiritual warfare in, in this kind of engagement. So now in the next lesson, we want to kind of get into the detail. So how do we do this? And uh, of course, we're going to do it as, as, as a people, as a group. Um, you know, uh, you can do it as an individual in your personal prayer. So uh, in your prayer time, there is time that you spend in fellowship with God. And there is also time that you spend in exercising spiritual authority. And we can do it corporately, collectively. That means two or more of us praying together. You know, we, we engage in prayer and worship. That is, us going before God. But we all, and we also exercise spiritual authority that is going against the devil. Right? So both, both aspects are happening. And the prayer and worship is towards God. Intercession is happening towards God. And then we exercise spiritual authority against the devil against what he is doing. Now, of course, in exercising spiritual authority, uh, praying and exercising spiritual authority, we are not controlling people's will or we are not dictating their choices, right? Every person has to make their own choice uh, to uh, receive Christ. And we are not uh, trying to manipulate them spiritually or we are not trying to make their decision. But through our prayer worship and through the exercise of spiritual authority, we are making it easier for people to respond. It's like we can open the prison doors, but of course the prisoner has to walk out. Right? We can't walk out for them. Prisoner has to walk out, but we can open the doors through our prayer, through the exercise of spiritual authority. We open the doors and then we call them, come forth, like we read in Isaiah 49. We tell those who are in darkness, come to the light, so we can shine the light, and we can call them into the light. But, of course, they have to make the choice to come out of the prison or to step into the light. We, we, and we, we cannot make that decision for them. We are not forcing anybody to do it, but we can make it easy for them. That is through our prayer and through the exercise of spiritual authority. So... There are two parts, and just to break it down for us to understand it, and, and I'm sure you have learned these things, you've studied these things in the course on uh, prayer and intercession. Uh, I think Pastor Nancy may have taught it, I'm not sure, but you know, some, somebody did that course with you on prayer and intercession. So you've studied that, and uh, so this is more of a, a review of that same uh, material, same uh, learning. So there is the prayer side, that is, we are praying to the Lord with regards to the Lord. Of course, there are a lot of things we can pray about. We can or just engage in prayer for communion. We can engage in prayer for fellowship. Uh, we can engage in prayer interceding for other believers. Uh, we can engage in prayer for so many things. But here we're talking specifically on uh, praying for the work for the Lord's work towards the lost, towards the unsaved. So that's what we're doing, okay? So I'm not, we're not covering everything about prayer. We are just focusing on this part. And then we will also talk about the spiritual warfare part, which is uh, how do we, through worship, through the exercise of spiritual authority, disrupt, disrupt and destroy what Satan is doing to hinder the people, right? So like we saw earlier, you know, he could be blinding their minds, he could be holding them in bondage. He could be uh, um, trying to uh, uh, create all kinds of philosophies, all in the minds of people, holding them. And how do we dismantle that, disrupt that, through the exercise of our spiritual authority, so that people then, of course, we have to proclaim the gospel, so, but at least when we go to proclaim the gospel, or when people uh, hear the gospel, they are a little bit more free in their mind and in their spirit to receive the gospel. The things that are hindering them have been dealt with, have been removed, so that then the gospel can penetrate their minds 
and they can receive. What can we do? So number one, first part, praying for the lost. How do we pray? Here are some, uh, you know, and I'm, and I'm, I'm trying to approach this based on scripture, right? Um, of course, people can come up with lots of points and so on. But what do we see in scripture as with regards to we, how we are supposed to pray for the people? So number one is we ask God for that region or city. Uh, on what basis do we do this? Psalm 2 and verse 8. We are all familiar with it. You know, in Psalm 2 verse 8, God says, Ask of me and I will give you the uh, nations for your inheritance and the uttermost parts of the earth for your possession. Uh, uh, we know in Psalm 2, it's like a conversation going on between God the Father, God the Son. And, and in Christ, we inherit this promise. This is for us as well. So what is he saying? He's saying, ask me and I will give you the nations for your inheritance. And the uttermost parts of the earth, which would include every city, every region, every country, uttermost parts for your possession. So God is saying, you ask me, I will give you. So we are going to him based on that promise, uh, his invitation. And you're saying, God, we ask, and you know, whatever city, whatever region, or whatever community, you're saying, God, give me the city. So that's a prayer, it's ongoing. We are extending our faith for the city. Oh God, give me the city. Give me the people, the souls of the people. You see, when we're praying for the city, the region, we're not talking about the material land or buildings. We're talking about the people in the city. That's what we're crying for. Right? And God's saying, I'll give you the heathen, the people, the unsaved. I'll give them to you as an inheritance and the uttermost part of the earth for your possession. The second thing is yeah, we are inviting the work of the Holy Spirit. You see, in John 16, 7 through 11, Jesus made it very clear on what the Holy Spirit does with regard to the world. He said, when he, the Spirit comes, when the Holy Spirit comes, he will convict the world. What's he going to do? He's going to convict the world of sin, righteousness, and judgment. So we are praying according to what Jesus said. He's saying, Lord, we invite the Holy Spirit in this place, you know, so that place may be the city or people that you're ministering to. Holy Spirit, we invite you to convict them of sin, righteousness, and judgment. So the conviction of the Holy Spirit should come upon the people. So we are praying and inviting the Holy Spirit for a particular group of people. You see, God declares what he intends doing, but our prayer and our intercession specifically invite him for you know, a situation. So through our prayer, intercession, for the people, the Holy Spirit, we want you to convict this group, the people in this city, or people in this community, Holy Spirit, let your conviction come upon them according to what Jesus said. Convict them of sin, righteousness, and judgment. Now, of what sin will he convict them of? But Jesus said, of sin, because they do not believe in me. Right? Of righteousness, because our man's righteousness cannot meet up to the righteousness of God. Of judgment because the prince of this world is judged. The ruler of this world is judged. Satan has been judged. That means everybody else who's part of his group is going to be judged. Right? So people need to have a conviction uh, coming into their hearts and minds that look, if I do not believe in Jesus, that's the greatest sin, which cannot be forgiven. Right? Of sin, righteousness, judgment. You know? So the Holy Spirit convicts them. Now, we proclaim the gospel, but it's the Holy Spirit is bringing about conviction in the hearts of the unsaved, that they need Jesus. Their righteousness is not enough. Satan has been judged. So you know, the Holy Spirit brings about that conviction. Third thing we pray is for God to draw them. You know, so Jesus said, no man can come to me unless the Father draw him. 
No one can come unless the Father draw him. So we are saying, Jesus said, you know, Father has to draw them. So we are praying, Lord, draw people to yourself. We are praying according to John 6, 44. John 12, 32, Jesus said, if I be lifted up, I will draw all men to myself. Lord, draw people in this city. Draw people in this community. Because we're praying according to the scriptures. Lord, draw them. Draw them to you. So that means there is the pull of heaven on their heart. Now, this is something spiritual. Right? This is something um, God will do. You know, and Amos, Amos chapter 9, verse 11, 12, Amos says, the Gentiles will come seeking for the Lord. So how will they come seeking? Well, God is drawing them. That's what they're coming. Say something in their heart saying, I, I need to go. I need to be here. I need to find out. I need to seek after. You know, what is that? That's the draw of heaven, the pull of heaven on their hearts. And so we're asking God to do that. We also pray. Now we're praying all, all of this is according to the scriptures. Next, we are praying that God will bring them to repentance, to the knowledge of the truth. They can escape the trap of the evil one. This is according to 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 25 and 26, because that Paul makes it very clear that those who are opposed to the gospel, what is their spiritual condition? They are taken captive by the enemy. And to come out of that, God needs to grant them. That means God needs to work in their hearts in such a way that they will come to a place of repentance, to the knowledge of the truth, and they can escape this trap of the devil. Right? So that's a work of God. That is not the work of man. Our work is to proclaim the gospel. Our work is to pray. But God is the one who works in them to bring them to this place of repentance and knowledge of the truth. So we are praying, God, move on them to bring them to this place of repentance, knowing the truth and escaping the snare or the trap of the evil one. A uh, few more things we see in scripture is the Holy Spirit is the one who's going to open spiritual eyes to enlighten them. So this is, of course, Paul is praying this prayer for the believers in Ephesians 1, 15 to 21, for their eyes to be open to know him. But if the believer's eyes can be opened by the Holy Spirit, how much more that, 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 that opening of the blind eyes? So we know, see, even those in darkness, their eyes need to be opened. Just like believers, their eyes need to be opened to know God more, to know the you know, the, the, the revelation of God, our, our eyes need to be open. So also here, the unsaved, the arindans, and we saw their eyes need to be open to know Jesus. So who's going to open their eyes? Uh, the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of Wisdom, Revelation. He's the one who can open blind eyes spiritually. And so Lord, we say open their eyes, that they may see Jesus. They may know the truth. They may be able to receive the truth. Like, now, using our spiritual authority, we're going to pull down the curtain of blindness. We're going to deal with all the, you know, the, the ideas, the arguments, the reasonings, the strongholds, the thoughts that the enemies put in their minds. That's, we will talk about it later. So we are doing that using our spiritual authority, but also we're praying for the Holy Spirit to open their eyes so that they can see Jesus. We also need to pray for the laborers. Uh, Jesus taught us that in Matthew 9, 37 to 38. He said, pray to the Lord of the harvest that he will send forth laborers, people who is going to share the gospel. Lord, fill this city, fill this land with laborers, with people who are sharing the gospel, who are influencing people with the gospel. And another thing we see is to pray for mighty signs and wonders. Uh, Acts chapter 4. What did, you know, when the early church were facing opposition, what do they do? They pray. They said, Lord, look at their threatenings and uh, you stretch out your hand to heal and let signs and wonders and miracles be done in the name of your son, Jesus Christ. So they are praying. We want to see more of your power, your demonstration, your miracles. So that is what they were praying. 
and, uh, and, and then subsequently, Acts 5, Acts 6, you know, we see powerful things taking place. You know, there are angels, there are visions, dreams, people have encounters. Uh, there are mighty healings taking place in the city of Jerusalem. So God is moving in response to the prayer. So we know that uh, although this is recorded only once, this, is probably, this probably was an ongoing prayer for the people there. You know, they, they continued praying. Uh, for the Lord to work signs and wonders. So we can see these seven clear um, uh, areas of prayer that we can engage in in relation to the loss, right? So we are, we are, we are fighting or we're engaging in prayer, we're interceding for the loss, and these are the things we can pray for as we pray for the loss. Let me pause here and see if there are any questions uh, anybody need, would like to ask. Any questions? We all clear on this? All good? Pastor, I have a question. Yeah, go ahead. So when we are engaging in prayer for the nations or we are engaging in uh, prayers for the souls, should we continue to pray or should we also be, you know, uh, concerned about the fruitfulness of it? Like, uh, uh, thinking about how, much, how many prayers are being answered, how many souls are being saved, or should we continue to just pray and keep thanking God for the work he's doing? Yeah, so, uh, so we, we definitely have to continue praying because uh, this is an ongoing thing, right? So uh, the battle for souls, is not a let's say it's not like a you know a small thing because the enemy has people in uh, in their grip and it is a, it is it is an ongoing battle and at the same time yes we want to see the fruit we want to see the results um, uh, but remember in addition to praying and we will see in the next chapter in addition to praying there has to be the proclamation of the gospel. Right? So praying is preparing the ground or preparing the atmosphere, the spiritual atmosphere for the work of proclamation or reaching out. So we, uh, we should be doing both. Uh, Jesus said, go into all the world and preach the gospel. So if you only pray, but we're not preaching and proclaiming the gospel, then we are not going to be seeing the fruit of our prayer because it's like uh, we, are, we are praying, but then we need to put the sickle in to bring the harvest, which is that is we need to go in there, we need to proclaim the gospel, we need to you know, help give people opportunities to hear the gospel uh, and, and then experience the power of God and come to faith in Christ. So to answer your question, we must do both. We must continue to engage in prayer and uh, continue proclaiming the gospel and then looking for the fruit. Because if we are not seeing the fruit, which is, you know, souls being saved, people coming in, then uh, we need to find out why, what is happening, right? Otherwise, we will, uh, we will not know, you know, what, what is keeping people from coming to the Lord, what is hindering people from coming to the Lord. So uh, we need to look for the fruit. We need to see the fruit of our prayer. And we need to know, you know, how do we engage in prayer better? How do we go about bringing the gospel to the people in a better way so that we can see fruit? So all these three aspects are connected and we need to be looking at all of these three. All right, good. Any other questions? Um, Shri Kumar, please go ahead. Yes, sir. sir, I want to know, um, is, it, um, um, uh, is it wrong that um, we pray in the church um, um, for the nations and for the cities in our regular services? Uh, like, um, uh, I just want to know that one thing because um, I recently heard that, um, you know, Jesus has not prayed for the nation and the apostles never prayed for the nations. And in the 
so is that is that uh, is that statement is right i just want to know that in the in the normal services like like a sunday service is wrong to pray for the for the nations of the city or uh, do we have an another separate day to be uh, to have this thing has to be you know uh, we have the church has to gather together and pray thank you sir mm. so i think there are two questions one one part of the question is uh, is it right or wrong to pray for the nation second is uh, should we do it on a sunday service or should we keep uh, set aside a different day and time to do it so first uh, to answer using scripture you know psalm 28 the very first scripture we saw the father is saying ask of me and i will give you nations for your inheritance so you know we he is telling us to pray he is telling us to ask ask me of course the father is speaking to the son you know that what you know this day i will come to you and then he says ask of me and i'll give you nations now we inherit it in christ and so in christ we are asking so you know right there psalm 28 is the answer to that question the father himself says ask of me and i will give you nations for your inheritance and the uttermost parts of the earth for your possession so there is nothing wrong uh, in, in in praying in fact when you read through the psalms uh, in the psalms you find prayer for the nation over that the gentiles see it's very interesting the psalms are not just speaking about the jewish people the psalms in many psalms they are referring talking about the nations that the nations may know that the gentiles may know it's in the psalms so that's an, again and 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 i think it would be nice to compile that list or well, maybe i'll try to do that so it's nice to you know see that hey throw the psalms in their the psalms of course are people praying worshiping praying to god and in those in the psalms there is the prayer for the gentiles for the nation so biblically the uh, the other thing let me mention this the other thing in acts chapter 4 when the early church is praying they are quoting psalm 2 and verse 8 for not come to verse 8 says speak about the verse preceding that why do the nations rage and why do the rulers of the people imagine a vain thing they are, so when the the early church is praying in acts 4 they are quoting psalm 2 that means they are praying based on psalm 2 right and only a portion of that is recorded in acts 4 but we can assume that they would have prayed the entire psalm or other psalms as well in their prayer and they are using that in relation to people who are not saved for them to encounter the power of god now acts chapter 4 so this is the third uh, 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 biblical response so, so three three responses that yes biblically we can see that uh, it is right for us to pray for the nation to pray for people to encounter Jesus Christ and whether it's a community whether you're praying for a city whether you're praying for the leaders of the city which we see in first timothy 2 or you're praying for a nation right so it's a second question is when and where to do it now the bible doesn't tell us so that choice is left to the people i mean first timothy chapter 2 now uh, paul is saying you know after he says i i exhort them for their prayers supplications intercessions giving of thanks be made for all men uh, uh you know so basically he says pray for everyone first timothy chapter 2 verse 1 you know pray for all men which means all the gentiles all the unsaved pray for all of them then he says specifically for rulers and for those who are in authority that we may lead a quiet and peaceful life but where does that have prayer have to happen if you go down to verse 8 he says I will therefore that men pray everywhere 
lifting up holy hands without wrath or doubting. Same chapter, First Timothy chapter 2, 1 and 2, and then I'm jumping to verse 8. Where should we pray? Pray everywhere. Right? So it doesn't matter whether we pray Monday to which day of the week or where we are praying, but he says pray everywhere. So it is up to us, right? There is no rule. He just says pray everywhere. Uh, pray like this everywhere. Pray for all men. So some churches prefer not to do it on a Sunday service, Sunday morning service, because uh, there will be newcomers and uh, you know visitors, people who don't understand what uh, prayer intercession is. So they keep it to a separate service. And it has happened, you know, I remember once, and this has happened in the early days, uh, once I kind of led the church, and now and then sometimes I might just lead the congregation into prayer intercession. I don't do it all the Sundays, but I remember once, you know, I kind of just led it, led in prayer, and we were praying very strong, and we prayed for the city. And then after that, somebody came and said, they, you know, they got, uh, they were upset because we were praying against uh, uh, demonic strongholds. And I think that particular Sunday we mentioned idolatry and so on. So they were like shaken up, you know, they like, so, you know, so uh, the thing is in a Sunday morning service, it's good to pray because we're all together. Um, but then they could be also, you know, uh, visitors, they could be strangers, they could be people who don't understand these things. And it sometimes it could be, uh, it, it might offend them. Well, what is them, you know, they're praying against idolatry or they're praying against this and that. So that's one way to look at it. So that's why most times, you know, there's a separate prayer meeting where believers come, those who understand what prayer intercession is, is about, they come to those meetings and there, there is a little bit more open and more, um, you know, vocal expressions of prayer and uh, taking spiritual authority, which is, doesn't happen in the Sunday service. So I think the answer to your second part of the question is, uh, you know, it can vary. Uh, we will leave it to the church leadership to decide uh, because they know what kind of people are coming. Uh, and so what would be okay, what would be not okay. Uh, we'll just leave it to them. Thank you, Pastor. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Any other questions? All right. Let's move ahead. Um, so, so we said these are things we could pray for in in relation to the loss, and just put down something. And if, if there may be other things you would want to add, then secondly, in if spiritual warfare, that means now we are going to go against what Satan is doing. Very important before we start engaging in spiritual warfare, that is in just going confronting demonic powers is that we must be really well established in truth. We must be established in truth. Uh, so as believers, right? So first is we must be established that Satan has been defeated. You know, and then you can look at all these scriptures and see that Satan has been crushed. He's been expelled. He's been condemned. That means just judgment has already been pronounced on him. He's been disarmed, he's been destroyed, and he is powerless. So we as believers must be absolutely you know, settled in our hearts and minds. Jesus finished the work. We are facing an enemy who's been crushed, expelled, condemned, disarmed, destroyed, powerless. So there is no fear in our hearts, Satan or, or any of his demonic spirits. And secondly, we have complete mastery and dominion over the devil and we need to be convinced about this luke 10 verse 19 again familiar scripture jesus said i give you authority over all the power of the enemy and nothing will by any means hurt you so in that conflict against the enemy jesus assured us nothing will by any means hurt us so we are not expecting the enemy to harm us, hurt us, or succeed in hurting us in any way as we go. So there is no fear. Oh, if I go against the devil, he's going to come and trouble me, yeah, trouble me. No, no. Jesus said nothing will by any means harm, hurt you, harm, harm you. So we are confident in that. And we, we are confident that we are seated 
at the right hand of the Father, in Christ, in the heavenly places, far above all principality and dominion. And Satan and all his demonic parts are way beneath our feet, way beneath us. And then when we are going into spiritual warfare, we are not trying to gain victory, but we're here to enforce victory. Right? So that means the enemy is doing something that we have the authority and the power to dismantle, to destroy. Uh, and Jesus has already authorized us. So think about this in Matthew 28, 18 and 19. Jesus said, all authority in heaven and on earth is given to him. So all authority on earth belongs to Christ. We are the body of Christ. So that means the body of Christ is carrying all authority on earth. So when we are engaging in spiritual warfare, going against the enemy, we are coming from a place of having all authority on our side. Satan has no authority. We have all authority because we are the body of Christ, the one to whom all authority on earth is given. So we are not contending for victory. We are here to enforce the victory in the lives of the people for whom Jesus Christ has died. Okay? So Jesus, for the people whom, whom uh, we are contending for, Christ has already died for them. He has shed his blood for them. Uh, the blood of, the, of Christ has been sprinkled for all nations. So we are now here to enforce that. And say, okay, devil, these people no longer belong to you. Christ has shed his blood. And so we are calling them out of the prison. We are opening up the prison door so they can come out. We are bringing in the light of the gospel so they can transition from darkness to light. So that's what we are doing. And number four, from our side, we have to keep all entry points closed. So that's our responsibility. That means while I have a lot of all authority as a believer, and I know the devil has been defeated. I need to watch over my own life, right? If I have entry points in my life, then uh, basically if I have sin, ongoing sin in my life, then the enemy is going to use that to enter in. It's like a weak spot or a weak point. Right? So that's why the Bible tells us, you know, First uh, 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 John 5, it says, Whoever is born of God keeps himself, and that wicked one cannot touch him. So there is a prerequisite, so to speak. That means I need to keep myself. I need to guard myself. Then the devil can't touch me. Right? But if I'm not doing that, then, of course, the enemy is going to be able to uh, come into some entry point. So... If there is personal private sin, if there is strife, there is uh, strife with other people, if there is, uh, you know, wrong attitudes, uh, bitterness, jealousy, or those are all entry points. So we, we need to really guard our lives and give no place to the devil. Ephesians 4.27, give no place to the devil as we engage. So we are protected. There's no question about it. But we need to keep all doors closed, right? So that's something we need to do, part of our preparation. And lastly, we understand that words uh, are, is how we engage, uh, the words of authority. And so Jesus said, you know, you bind on earth and you release on earth. But how are we going to bind and lose? It's, uh, you know, it's not like we are tying people up and untying people with ropes. That's not it. It's our words. Through the words we speak, we are exercising our authority, and uh, through the words we speak, we are able to bind and lose. Right? So we are engaging in that, uh, in that manner, through the words we speak, words of authority, we engage uh, with the enemy. So we must understand the importance of words. So I, I would present these five aspects as part of our preparation uh, in, uh, for us as leaders, 
as well as for the people that they need to be well established in this and these truths before we lead them out into battle it's like yesterday we said you know we need to get the civilians we need the civilians need to be trained soldiers before they are sent out into battle we don't just send civilians straight into battle right so this training will has to happen and so we we you know over time you know we can't do this overnight over time we slowly equip the people we gear them up we get them ready for getting into battle right and then we step into exercising spiritual authority but before we get into the next section are there any questions in terms of preparation for spiritual battle uh, are we all together on this any questions on that preparing people to get into spiritual warfare you know so uh, initially you have your core team and then you have people coming in to your the pioneering work now let's say the church has you know 50 people 100 people whatever now you need to get them all ready before we can say let's get into you know praying for the lost and so that will take time and we need to prepare them any questions on that all okay all right so let's just move forward so how do we actually engage so first praise and worship is very very important right so we know we are praising and worshiping god but that is actually preparing us and is also preparing the spiritual environment for the exercise of authority no praise and worship is towards god but our praise and worship towards god has an effect on the enemy right what kind of an effect does it have i'll i'll just quickly highlight some of these things maybe we'll pick this up again next week we know psalm 8 verse 2 He said, "Out of the mouth of babes and sucklings, you ordain praise, that you might stop the enemy, or you might still the avenger." Right? Uh, Jesus quotes that in Matthew twenty-one and verse sixteen. So the praise that is coming out of the mouths of God's people, which is going up towards God, is actually an expression of strength. against the powers of darkness that stops the powers of darkness so our praise is going up to god but us praising god is our strength against the enemy to stop the enemy okay. so think about it right we are worshiping god we are praising god we ordain praise out of our mouth god is ordain praise it is ascribing praise and glory and magnifying god but our praising and magnifying god is stopping it is stopping the enemy it is putting a pause to his work a great example to look at it is in in first samuel chapter 5 was one through four um i'll mention this here we'll pick this up again next week is about you know you see this ark of the covenant it was captured by the philistines and it was take, they took it into their temple and placed it uh, in the temple of uh, their god dagon so remember the ark of the covenant it is a symbol of god's presence among his people it was a box that they carried that had you know the uh, you know everything whatever god wanted there for it there and that was a symbol of god's presence now the philistines took it into their the temple of their god and put it there very interesting the next day they come they find the statue or dagon fallen to the ground it's symbolic but very powerful so they come put it back up next day they come and they find it broken then they realize hey 
this Ark of the Covenant, this box which we have brought in here, is so powerful. It's knocking down our God. Taken, so they took it out. Okay, so it's giving us a very powerful message: the Ark of the Covenant, the symbol of God's presence among His people. What does it do? It dislocates demonic powers. Psalm 22 verse 3, that when we praise God, his, his throne is established amongst us. So our praise and our worship is saying, God, we come be enthroned. When God is enthroned, the enemy is dethroned. The enemy is displaced, is dislocated. So we'll pause here. We'll talk a little bit more about this next week. We'll pick up from here. So the first step towards exercising spiritual, spiritual authority is just the presence of God to praise and worship, establishing that. So we as a people, you know, whether it's two, three, five, ten, or fifty, or hundred, or whatever number, through our praise and worship, we are establishing the presence of God. Yeah. Okay. We'll pause here. I will pick this up next week and go forward. Christopher, your question, please. Uh, yes, uh, Pastor, thank you. Um, so just to uh, make a look, uh, you know, some, if you could give us some, give, give us some guidance on how you would explain this point uh, to uh, to an unbeliever. Uh, you know, this, this point number three, um, uh, you mentioned about, uh, you know, we're not contending for victory, we're here to enforce the victory. Jesus already obtained for us. And Satan and all his demons have been cast, expelled, or condemned, disarmed, and destroyed. Um, and yet, you know, um, he is, you know, existing. He's operating right now um, uh, in in the world. Um, so, just how do, how how would we explain that? I mean, if Satan has already been crushed and, and destroyed, then you know, how is he still still operating right now? Okay. So we can look at it this way, and I'll try to be very brief, very brief in this. Um, one moment, uh, I'm just thinking, you know, I've, I've uh, we've done this, I explained this in my summit series. Let me just uh, pull that up here. Just give me a minute. Um, I am trying to look for that. And now I should be. Um, sorry, I will, I will answer a question. I just am looking for this. Um, okay. Uh, all right. Sorry. 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 So, we'll about the flash to that. All right. Um, sorry, um, Chris. I was just looking for that sermon series, kind of, but I kind of addressed it, and I can't remember which particular sermon. Anyway, so here's the thing. So, Christ finished the work on the cross. Those who have received his finished work can now walk in what he has done. But those who have not yet heard or submitted to his lordship are, so he, whatever he has provided, he's provided for the whole world. So you can think of the people, all people in two groupings. 
those who have come under the Lordship of Christ and those who have not come under the Lordship of Christ. Whatever Christ did on the cross, he did it for every human person, every person in the world. But those who come under his Lordship are able, have the privilege of walking in what he has completed. But when they don't come under the Lordship of Christ, the provision is there, but they cannot enjoy the provision, which means that the enemy, although he's defeated, still has a right of access over their lives. And so uh, a disarmed, defeated enemy still extends influence over them when it doesn't need to happen. It shouldn't be happening. But the enemy is disarmed. They don't know it. And they have not taken the step to come out of his weak. So he's much weaker than he actually is. But they've not taken the step to come under the Lordship of Christ. The same thing with a believer. If a believer does not know what is his in Christ, the enemy is able to extend influence. Now, the influence the devil ex ex exerts over us is mainly through deception. It's mainly through through untruth. Right? So it's not like he's so powerful, but he uses lies and deceptions to gain influence. That's it. So his deceptions are what defeat people. But though when we come under the Lordship of Christ, we can then expose his deceptions for the truth and walk in victory and authority. Is that okay? Uh, it's a very quick answer, but maybe we can pick it up next week and uh, get further into it. If you, if you just remind me at the start of the class, uh, we can do that. Yeah? Thank you. Okay. Um, yeah, so let's just... Uh, Pray together, and we will wrap up for today. But and uh, uh, you know we will probably start with the question from Christopher next week, I'm trying to understand this, and I'll probably also point to the um, the sermon that, that we had done some time back. Um, oh, thank you, Karun. I think that's what I was looking for. Satan, you have been defeated. Okay, so yeah, have a look at that and. Uh, and uh, we will pick this up as well. Okay? Thank you. Could somebody close in prayer, please? Then we'll dismiss. Anyone can pray? I'll pray, sir. Go ahead, Mangi. I let we... Yeah. We're just grateful, Lord, for this time, Lord. We yeah, grateful, Lord, for the knowledge, wisdom, Lord, and knowing that even though the Kairos moment hasn't arrived yet, but you have the victory. You have won all for us, Lord. Mm -hmm. And you've commissioned us, Lord, to go and bear witness of what you've done, Lord, so that the world may know you, the people might be set free, King, so that your kingdom may, may go forward, Lord. Mm. We pray, Father, that as we pass here today, Lord, let your Holy Spirit continue teaching us, Lord. Let us let it continue bringing forth new revelation, Lord, so that what we learn, Lord, may stick in our heart, bear fruit, and may be good steward and good good uh, witnesses of what you've done and what you've called us to do. In your mighty name, Lord Jesus, we pray. Amen. 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 Thank you. Thank you, everyone. I appreciate it. We'll uh, meet again soon. God bless. Bye now.